to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the men and women of your army are on the alert to defend our nation, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture. Welcome to the big picture. I'm Captain Carl Zimmerman, here to tell you about your United States Army. In past programs of the big picture, we told you the many different things that make your army the strongest fighting machine in the world. Today, we'd like to show you what the Army Medical Corps does to protect and save the lives of our soldiers wherever they are. Later on in our program, we want you to meet Lieutenant Colonel S.J. Newsom of San Diego, California, who is a division surgeon with the Army 7th Division in Korea. But first, we take you to Washington for a word of greeting by the Surgeon General of the Army, Major General George E. Armstrong. This program affords me a welcome opportunity to show you how the Army Medical Service does its job. Perhaps it will also give a basis for determining how well it does it. This is important because as we see our mission, we have an important responsibility, not only to the men and women of the United States Army, but to you as well. Today, this mission is not easily accomplished. We are fighting a cruel enemy in a disease-ridden country. Our troops are also scattered in many other sections of the world where it is impossible to assure the same environmental conditions which may have prevailed at home. This much we can say, that your loved ones are safer today than under any comparable conditions in the past. That if wounded, they have twice the chance for survival as in World War II, and more than three times that of World War I. The story of how this was accomplished is both involved and exciting. This was Korea early in July 1950 when American troops were rushed from Japan to stop the columns of red armor that were pushing south from the 38th parallel. Among the first to arrive were the medics, field surgeons, aid men, litter bearers, ambulance drivers. And essential supplies and equipment. Nurses arrived in a mobile surgical hospital unit on the way to the front. Although non-combatant, the men and women of the medical service are a part of the Army combat team. It is their job to conserve the Army's effective power and to evacuate and care for the sick and the wounded. Korea was a challenge to the Army medical service. Battle lines were fluid. The enemy was threatening the main road to the north beyond Taegu. We arrived in a strange country, its people uprooted by war. A country where malaria and dysentery are common, where epidemics of cholera and plague are a constant threat. In the early days of the Korean campaign, the planes that brought badly needed supplies and equipment were used to evacuate many of the more seriously ill and wounded. The air shuttle brought in blood plasma, drugs, bandages, and other items for the emergency care of the wounded. History Hit is a streaming platform that is just for history fans, with fantastic documentaries covering fascinating figures and moments in history from all over the world. From the Battle of Trafalgar and the Revolutionary Era, right through to the Second World War, if you are looking for your next military history fix, then this is the service for you.
We're committed to bringing history fans award-winning documentaries and podcasts that you cannot find anywhere else. Sign up now for a free trial, and War Stories fans get 50% off their first three months. Just be sure to use the code WARSTORIES at checkout. Surgical instruments and equipment, anesthetics, dressings, whole blood, and other items for the mobile surgical hospital a few miles behind the lines. Our field medical units move with the combat troops they support. Men of the Army Medical Service have followed our troops through every phase of the Korean campaign. From the early tank battles in the south, when our forces were heavily outnumbered by the enemy, to the invasion of Incheon in September 1950. They were with the tank men of the 1st Cavalry Division, who chased the Korean Reds out of their capital at Pyongyang. Men of the Army Medical Service jumped with the 4,100 paratroops who descended north of Pyongyang on 20 October 1950 to wipe out the remnants of General Kim's army. They were in the mountains along the Yalu River in November of that year when the Chinese Reds entered the conflict. They were with the troops of the 10th Corps who made the long winter withdrawal to Hung Nam. With the units of the 7th Infantry Division who were isolated and had to be evacuated by air with the exhausted troops who were evacuated from Hung Nam by sea. Wherever American troops have fought in Korea, the Army Medical Service has tended the sick and cared for the wounded. In every engagement along the present battlefront, from the mountains in the east, to the valley of the Imjin River in the west. Its aid men and surgeons support our troops in airborne operations, in armored sorties, on infantry patrols. Troops moving under fire are likely to suffer fairly heavy casualties. A trained medical aid man follows each infantry platoon into combat. The risks he takes to reach a wounded man while under fire often make the aid man himself a casualty. His main job is to keep the wounded man alive. Loss of blood is one of the main causes of death on the battlefield. Another is shock. The job of the litter bearers is equally hazardous and difficult. They are in a race against time. The first 24 hours after a soldier is hit may decide whether he is to live or die. Though exposed to enemy fire, they must be careful in removing the wounded man. They must get him to an aid station as quickly as they can. Approximately 98% of the men wounded in Korea have lived. One of the main reasons is speed in treatment. This is a battalion aid station, the beginning of a wounded man's swift journey through the echelons of medical aid. The man's first aid treatment is checked. Then he is rushed on for more definitive care. The average time spent here is only 72 minutes. Ambulatory cases walk the 300 to 800 yards back. Litter bearers are conserved for the more serious cases. The wounded man is tagged on the battlefield, and this record constantly receives additional information. Plasma is available here. The battalion aid station does what it can quickly, then hurries the man on. Many types of transportation are used in evacuation to the next echelon, the regimental collecting station. Wherever possible, ambulances are used. A 
Under most battle conditions, only jeeps are available. These are especially fitted to carry several litters. A battalion aid station must be very mobile and ready to move immediately if the enemy breaks through. Air evacuation is speediest of all. Often, certain channels of evacuation can be skipped, allowing the wounded to be carried directly to rear area hospitals. Behind the collecting stations are division clearing stations, serving a division area, and mobile surgical hospitals where major operating procedures necessary to save life and limb may be performed immediately. The results of speed have been shown by a hospital at Busan. Out of 18,000 wounded brought in during the first three months of the war, only 40 men died. An important factor in saving the lives of the wounded has been the military doctor's switch to specialization and training in orthopedics and surgery. The death rate of wounded in World War I was 8%. In World War II, it was 4.5%. Korea's 2% death rate is a milestone in military medicine. The wasteful use of doctors in administrative jobs has been largely eliminated. The latest techniques aided by antibiotics and the transfusions of whole blood are being used. As soon as possible, casualties not able to return to duty are moved back through the chain of evacuation, eventually reaching general hospitals outside the combat zone. From Korea, casualties are evacuated to Japan by air, frequently bypassing many ground installations. This relieves the workload of such installations and eliminates excessive handling of casualties. Combat cargo planes are used primarily for this air evacuation. The speed and comfort of air evacuation contributes greatly to the morale and quick recovery of the patient. Wounded men are often being treated in general hospitals in Japan in less time than it would normally take to evacuate them to the division clearing station. Wherever American troops are engaged in combat, medical care is nearby. There are 15 aid men to an infantry battalion, one medic for every platoon. The work of the aid man is best told by Private Lubeck of the 7th Division. I'd like to let you people at home know what a terrific job the frontline medics and the army nurses are doing here for us boys. I know because I was a casualty myself. The frontline medics did everything possible in getting me back to the battalion aid station and to Wanju. From there, the army nurses did everything to comfort me all the way to Tokyo. I'd like to let you know that the army nurses and these frontline medics are doing everything in their power to help GI back to recovery. Helicopters with specially constructed containers on the sides have played a major role in the rapid evacuation and care of wounded. Liaison planes are also used near the front whenever possible. Many a wounded man who could not have survived a jeep or ambulance ride over the rough roads of Korea owes his life to these evacuation planes. Thousands of casualties, most of them litter cases, have been flown from Korea to permanent hospitals in Japan. The majority of these were flown in from the big supply centers of Pusan and Taegu. It takes only an hour and a half by plane, in contrast with two days travel by ship. Here, Japanese civilians are utilized in handling the patients, although no Japanese doctors are used.
more than half of all the wounded in Korea have been evacuated to Japan. When newly evacuated patients from Korea have been placed aboard ambulances, they are taken to permanent hospitals nearby for further treatment. Here, casualties are checked to determine the type of treatment required. So far in the Korean War, combat wounds have been about 70% orthopedic, 16% surgical. It is felt that the striking similarity of most Korean wounds has been due to the lack of communist air power and the fact that most encounters with the enemy have been rifle and artillery duels. In the army hospitals in Japan, the seriously ill or wounded soldier obtains expert care and all the comforts of a modern civilian hospital. However, he is not allowed to remain here unless he is expected to return to duty in a few weeks. He is moved by ambulance to Haneda Air Force Base near Tokyo for the long airlift home. Haneda Air Force Base is the terminal in Japan of the Pacific Air Shuttle operated by the Air Force's Military Air Transport Service. These big planes can carry as many as 80 litter patients at a time. The planes usually stop in Hawaii to break the strain of the journey for the wounded men. After an overnight rest and medical attention at Tripler Army Hospital, they are again on their way. After a flight of over 8,000 miles across the Pacific, they reach Travis Air Force Base near San Francisco. Here, they are moved temporarily to the Army Disembarkation Hospital for a rest and the necessary medical attention. As soon as the patient has recovered from the strain of the trip, he is evacuated to that Army Hospital in the United States, which is considered best suited to give him the treatment he needs. Within two weeks of the day he was hit on the battlefield, the wounded man may arrive at one of the general hospitals in the U.S., such as Walter Reed General Hospital, largest and most complex of the many hospitals maintained by the Army Medical Service. We've shown you how the Army medics take care of our wounded. And now we'd like you to meet an Army medical officer, Lieutenant Colonel S.J. Newsom of San Diego, California, who is a division surgeon with the 7th Division in Korea. Well, Colonel Newsom, just what is the most important thing in keeping this wounded man alive? I think the speed is the most important thing. Anything we can do that reduces the time between the time that the wounded man is cared for by the company aid man and the, the time that the surgeon takes care of him is important. The first few hours mean the difference between that man's recovery and his failure to recovery. Mm -hmm. The uh, helicopter has been of immense value to us for the seriously wounded cases and their transportation. But perhaps most important is the fact that we brought the trained surgeon, his equipment, the blood and the antibiotics up farther forward. Well now, when an outfit goes into an attack, can the medics make any plans in advance as to treatment and evacuation of their wounded? We always make plans, and then we make alternate plans. But the most important thing there is that we leave our organization flexible so that we can fit it to meet the exact situation that develops. Well, now, a moment ago, you spoke about bringing the surgeons closer to the front line. But once we have them there, what sort of uh, facilities do they have? They really lack nothing that is essential to the proper care of the patient. The man is the important thing. And if you have the man plus enough equipment to do the job, you can do as fine a job in the tent in Korea as you can in an approved hospital in the States. Well, that's very good to know, Colonel. Uh, well, looking back on uh, your experiences in Korea, what were the major handicaps in caring for this man? Well, we had a lot of handicaps. First of all, we had mountains, high mountains, and miserable roads. And then we had hot, humid summers and miserable cold winters. We had mud in between. 
occasionally medics had to fight the enemy in their self defense and in the defense of their patients but from a medical standpoint perhaps the most important thing was disease because korea is a disease ridden country but what diseases were there colonel but we just had everything we had everything that in the book we have the same pneumonias that we have at home we have smallpox as a much more virulent and deadly disease in the orient and lastly we had a whole group of oriental diseases that most of our people had never seen before these were important because they affected not only the frontline man but every soldier in korea and not only the soldiers but the civilians mm -hmm. well, what did you do about this disease well, in the first place, we had a very complete immunization system. And then we had a preventive medicine program that served to provide environmental control and so reduce the contacts. So that the net result of it was that we had much more of a potential situation than we had what would have been a medical disaster. We've been talking, Colonel, about taking care of the soldier in Korea. What about the soldier in other parts of the world? Well, wherever American soldiers are stationed, we carry the high quality of American medical service with them. The basic things are always there, but the special equipment and special things are done by hand tailoring them to fit exactly the situation that we're up against, no matter what part of the world we're serving in. Well, thank you, Colonel Newsom. And that's what we'd like to show right now on the big picture, how the Army medics Continually keep prepared to serve the soldier no matter where he is stationed. Wherever the American soldier serves today, wherever he may have to fight for our American way of life, now or in the uncertain future, under whatever conditions he may have to fight, the Army Medical Service is alert to his welfare. The American soldier may have to face the hazards of battle in an arctic or subarctic climate. Where speedy evacuation of the wounded is an absolute necessity, where loss of body heat can be as deadly as loss of blood. He may have to fight again in the prostrating heat of fever-ridden tropical jungles. He may have to serve in some of the Earth's great subtropical cities where epidemics take a heavy toll of human lives year after year. The Army Medical Service is on guard against the threat of disease wherever it is found. It is the great scourge of armies and knows no national barriers. At the Medical Service Research Center in Washington, scientists obtain data on outbreaks from all parts of the world. They maintain a constant quest for effective countermeasures. Recently, they tested the effectiveness of chloromycetin, a new antibiotic. It was found to be a remedy not only for typhus, but also for typhoid fever, and is valuable in the treatment of virus pneumonia and Rocky Mountain fever. The new antibiotic now is saving lives in Korea. Our doctors in Korea and Japan encountered an epidemic type of sleeping sickness. Our research scientists isolated the virus, identified a mosquito as the carrier, and developed a vaccine that is proving effective. This type of research and development on cures and preventions against disease is carried on throughout the world. As a result, the Army Medical Service has been able to control any major outbreak of disease among our troops in Korea. Although among Korean civilians, typhoid fever and dysentery are common, although malaria is prevalent and smallpox and other virulent diseases are endemic, disease rate among our troops has remained extremely low. To protect our troops, the Army Medical Service has inoculated large segments of the Korean population. It has sprayed whole cities with DDT to eradicate the insects flies, mosquitoes, lice, fleas, that are the common disease carriers. It has inoculated our troops against disease for which it had vaccines and serums. It has guarded against contamination of the soldiers' food. 
and water. In Puerto Rico, scientists gather data on tropical diseases. In Germany, on epidemic jaundice. In remote Madagascar, our scientists are working with the French on bubonic plague. The Army's Medical Research Center in Washington directs this far-flung battle against disease. Here, men have pioneered in the conquest of the Earth's unseen killers in measures to prevent infection, in the development of the life-saving vaccines and serums, of antibiotics like penicillin, streptomycin, and chloromycetin, of other drugs like primaquine, the new cure for malaria, that have helped to reduce the death rate from disease in the U.S. Army to barely one in 2,000 each year. In other research projects, the Army Medical Service has developed new surgical techniques and devices. At Fort Knox, Kentucky, laboratory tests are being made in an effort to overcome the hazards of climate. Medical research workers are learning what a soldier's body needs to survive and function in extreme cold or in extreme heat. The Army Medical Service is at work on measures to protect the American soldier against the hazards of an atomic war. Since its beginning in 1775, the Army Medical Service has constantly raised standards of health and medical care among American troops. The Army Medical Service pioneered the development of the modern cubicle plan hospital. It brought fresh air into it. It devised ways to purify our drinking water. To guard against food contamination. It introduced techniques for the control of insects and other disease carriers. It pioneered in the knowledge of countless contagious diseases. The medical service, a recognized body of trained technicians from the company aid man in the field to the research scientist in the laboratory is dedicated to the welfare of the American soldier. That's your Army Medical Corps, an indispensable part of our fighting team. Next week on The Big Picture, we'll show you how the Army is concerned with the soldier's spiritual welfare as well as his physical welfare. We'd like to tell you about our chaplains. This is Captain Carl Zimmerman inviting you to be with us then. Today, the latest weapons, coupled with the fighting skill of the American soldier, stand ready, on the alert all over the world, to defend this country, you, the American people, against aggression. This is The Big Picture, an official television report to the nation from the United States Army. Now, to show you part of The Big Picture, here is Sergeant Stuart Queen. Fighting in Korea is over. The last gunshot of that epic struggle has long since echoed through the scarred hills, adding the final period to another chapter in history. Out of that struggle have come many accounts of great suffering and even greater heroism. But few of them can match the story you are about to see. For this is the story of the famous Indian heads, the men of the United States Second Infantry Division and the vital role they played in Korea. The date, June 28, 
1950. The place, Fort Lewis, Washington. You're passing in review with the 2nd United States Infantry Division, second to none. Behind you lay months of intensive training. Now the whole outfit is razor sharp. But there's something in the air today, and everyone feels it. Three days earlier, North Korean communists crossed the 38th parallel in an all-out invasion of South Korea. Yesterday, President Truman, with UN consent, ordered American air and sea power to aid the South Koreans. At this very moment, U.S. troops stationed in Japan were being alerted for combat, but they were few and would need support. They would need you. One month later, advance elements of the 2nd Division arrived at Busan, Korea, the first reinforcements to come directly from the United States. The situation at that time was critical. Overwhelming enemy forces had compressed the UN defenders into a tight ring around the port of Busan. Desperately holding the western sweep of this perimeter were understrength units of the 25th, 24th, and 1st Cavalry Division. Republic of Korea troops guarded the northern sector. 2nd Division troops were soon taking part in this heroic defense. The earlier arrivals were rushed to bolster 24th Division units along the Naktong River Line, southwest of Tegu. This was the payoff for those long months of training. The Communists had forced a bulge across the Naktong River. The newly arrived men of the 2nd Division teamed up with other units to flush the Reds out of the rice paddies and push them back across the river. By August 17th, the line was again intact. August 24th, with all its regiments now in Korea, the 2nd Division took over the 24th sector along the Naktong River. Seven battalions had to defend a line 40 miles long. All signs indicated a massive enemy buildup. The Reds were preparing for an all-out attempt to crush the Pusan perimeter. With Republic of Korea troops attached, the men of the division steeled themselves for their first real test of fire in the Korean War. The attack came on August 31st. For a week, the enemy tried fanatically to push through the second division sector. The thinly held line bent and wavered under the pressure, but held. The North Koreans' last major effort to push us into the sea had failed. Then the rains came, turning foxholes into waterholes, roads into quagmires. But morale was high, for the enemy had been stopped, and the UN breakout was pending. Then, on September 15, 1950, the tide of battle turned. Following in the wake of a terrific naval bombardment, troops of the US 10th Corps stormed ashore at Incheon, deep in red territory. The amphibious assault threatened to split the enemy forces in two. This was the signal for the breakout from the Pusan perimeter. After crushing heavy initial resistance, the men of the 2nd Division pushed across the Naktong River, the first U.S. soldiers to do so. One by one, the men and the vehicles made their way across the swollen river that had served them so well as a natural defense line. But that was behind them now. The time had come to take the offense. From the Pusan perimeter, the entire 8th Army moved out in a coordinated overland drive. The men of the Indian Head Division pushed northward, sweeping the scattered remnants of the once powerful North Korean Army before it. Tank infantry teams spearheaded the drive, bypassing thousands of trapped North Koreans in the south. Gaining momentum with each yard, units of the 2nd Division steamrolled as much as 73 miles in less than 10 hours. 
The retreat of the North Korean army had degenerated into a rout. By the end of September, organized resistance in South Korea had ceased. But numerous enemy pockets had been bypassed and were still waging guerrilla-type action behind our lines. The men of the Indian Head Division began to fan out rapidly in search of these bands. Clearing out these pockets of resistance was slow and dangerous work. The enemy was trapped and desperate, but showed little inclination to surrender. He had to be blasted out, hole by hole, hut by hut. The mopping up operations continued into October with excellent results. Before they were through, the men of the second division alone had killed or wounded almost 18,000 Reds, with another 7,000 captured. This represented two and a half North Korean divisions. The Republic of South Korea once again stood free as the Red Invaders were pushed back across the 38th parallel. This group of South Koreans left no doubt as to whose side they were on. Meanwhile, the battle raged in the north. A special combat group dubbed Task Force Indian Head moved into Pyongyang under fire. Their mission? To secure the airfields and guard vital installations. Pyongyang in UN hands, plans were being formulated for a final war-ending offensive to the Yalu River. Hopes ran high that the war would be over by Christmas. But alarming reports were coming in from all sectors. Reports of Chinese troops massing along the Manchurian border. On November 27th, the reports became reality as thousands of Chinese troops attacked across the Yalu River. Five Chinese divisions hit the Indian heads near Kunu Ri succeeding in cutting them off from the rest of the 8th Army. The situation was desperate. Soon, every unit in the division was under fire. The weather added to their miseries as the temperature began dropping rapidly. But the worst was still ahead. While rearguard troops fought fiercely on all sides, the 2nd Division began a general withdrawal. Chinese, however, had established a long, gun-studded roadblock between the division and friendly lines. At regular intervals along this fiery corridor, the columns came under the crossfire of red machine gun traps. Nothing to do but fight it out. Throwing every man and weapon into the battle, the Indian head division finally broke through. Together with the rest of 8th Army, the division commenced pulling all its units back for reorganization. It was winter now, with the thermometer down to minus 20. By New Year's, they had reached the banks of the Han River near Seoul. The fall of the South Korean capital was imminent, as 18 full Chinese divisions poured down from the north. The fight around Kunu Ri had cost the 2nd Division nearly a third of its strength in casualties, but the warriors still had plenty of fight left in them. The men of the division enjoyed a belated New Year's dinner before starting south again. Road movement was hampered by thousands of refugees fleeing before the advancing Chinese. By mid-January, UN forces had reorganized along a defense line extending from Pyeongtaek, well below Seoul on the west coast, northeast to Wanju. It was toward Wanju that the 2nd Division now headed.
Once in the new sector, the engineers immediately set to work leveling a division airstrip. There was no time to waste. For the Chinese were remassing their armed hordes for a new attack. The men of the 2nd Division knew this, but they were more aware of another factor, of the importance of one Jew itself. One Jew represented the right flank of the bulk of UN forces, the cornerstone that had to be held at any cost. Here, the Chinese would strike with everything they had in an attempt to envelop the entire 8th Army. Here, the men of the 2nd Division made their stand. In January, and again in February, the Indian heads hurled back wave after wave of frenzied attacks from Wanju to Chipyongni. The enemy, trying to smash through the 2nd Division, ran head-on into a solid wall of fire. winter offensive ground to a halt. The second division had stopped the Chinese for the first time since they had crossed the Yalu from Manchuria. Following the decisive victory at Wanju, the second division in conjunction with other units of the 8th Army made ready to launch a slow, methodical counteroffensive against the Reds. All across the peninsula, the UN forces ground northward in the face of stubborn enemy resistance. They called it Operation Killer, for the main objective was not real estate, but communist casualties. General Ridgway, the 8th Army commander, put it this way. We are interested only in inflicting maximum casualties to the enemy with minimum casualties to ourselves. To do this, we must wage a war of maneuver slashing at the enemy when he withdraws and fighting delaying action when he attacks. The men of the Indian Head Division did just that, and with great success. While the second division made its way up the Korean Peninsula, the Chinese main forces were beginning to gather their strength for a new offensive behind a thin screen of resistance. Those Reds left behind to stop the UN troops had only one way out and knew it. The enemy buildup continued so that by mid-May, the Chinese were ready to turn the full force of their offensive power against the warriors in the vicinity of Inje. Destroy the second division. That was the enemy's stated purpose. The division prepared to meet this challenge. For six days, the enemy tried vainly to overrun the second division troops. It was to be the worst defeat suffered by the Chinese, as 19,000 casualties fell before the Indian head guns. had been pushed back well north of the line from which they had launched their attack. For its heroic stand during the May action, the 2nd Division was awarded the Presidential Unit Citation, highest decoration the United States can bestow upon a unit. In part, the citation read that the division demonstrated superb battlefield courage, knowledge, and discipline, and displayed such gallantry, determination, and esprit de corps as to set it apart and above other units participating in similar operations. The men of the division had succeeded in shattering the Chinese offensive power for months to come in the action always to be remembered as the May Massacre. June and July represented a change of pace for the men of the second division as they went into reserve for a well-earned rest some of the units were assigned guard duty at various prisoner of war enclosures, playing military nursemaid to an enemy who, but a few weeks earlier, had tried to destroy them.
Even in reserve, the bulk of the division underwent a program of intensive training designed to maintain their sharp combat edge. By late July, the division was again heading for the front, now well north of the 38th parallel. Meanwhile, significant developments were taking place on the diplomatic front. After the United Nations had crushed the Chinese spring offensive during the May massacre, the Reds suddenly decided it was time to talk peace. Thus, on July 10th, at a place called Kaesong, UN and communist delegates met to lay the groundwork for armistice talks. Once again, hope ran high that the end of the war was near. The world waited anxiously while the delegates conferred. They didn't realize at the time that the communists intended to drag the talks through two years of propaganda speeches and impossible demands. No, the war was far from over in the summer of 1951, and no one knew it better than the men of the second division. While the talks bogged down, the men of the Indian Head Division advanced. The object now was commanding terrain, from which enemy movements could be observed. With Fools Mountain, began the first in a series of battles for control of the ridges. After thousands of artillery and mortar rounds were poured into the red emplacements, second division infantrymen moved out to take the hill. The Indian head troops found the enemy well entrenched. Resistance increased steadily as they neared the crest of the hill. Finally, Fools Mountain was in second division hands. boxcars immediately rushed food and supplies to the hilltop defenders, who were then able to ward off the counter-attacking Reds. With Fools Mountain secured, division engineers moved in to clear the area of mines. The dispossessed Reds had left a great many of these calling cards behind. Then the engineers fell to the task of repairing the roads, paving the way for the infantrymen to assault their next objective, Bloody Ridge. Once again, artillery, tank, and mortar fire overtured the attack. three weeks, the enemy clung stubbornly to Bloody Ridge, as tons of artillery and small arms fire blanketed his position. The battle for Bloody Ridge raged on throughout the hot month of August, as Indian head units followed each other in attempt after attempt to capture the crest. Then, on September 5th, they succeeded, and Bloody Ridge fell to the troops of the 2nd Division. But the smoke had hardly cleared over this hard-fought terrain when a bigger and bloodier battle began shaping up on the horizon. This piece of high ground now threatened the UN command in the second division sector. General Omar Bradley, visiting chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, received a briefing of the situation from Generals Ridgeway and Van Fleet. The enemy, organizing three battalions from his survivors of Bloody Ridge, was making a last-ditch stand at this jagged range soon to be known to the world as Heartbreak Ridge. Indian hit tanks, still action warm from the previous battle, loaded up and made ready to take part in the bitter struggle ahead. Facing four communist divisions in the vicinity, the warriors set out to begin Operation Touchdown, as every regiment in the division was ordered to lay siege on Heartbreak Ridge. The siege continued as the Air Force teamed up with 2nd Division units to blast the Reds from the top of the hill. Finally, on October 13th, 
After 30 consecutive days of constant bombardment, the Reds completely withdrew from the crest of Heartbreak Ridge. After a brief period in reserve, the men of the 2nd Division soon found themselves at the front again. This was the sector known as the Iron Triangle, so-called because it was formerly used by the Reds as a supply and assembly area during previous attacks against UN positions. Action now settled down to aggressive patrolling designed to keep close tabs on all enemy movements. But the enemy didn't seem inclined to do much moving, except when pushed. In April 1952, the division was again pulled off the line and assigned various rear area duties. Some of the units assumed the thankless job of screening and guarding the die-hard communist prisoners on the island of Koji Do. Others pitched in willingly to establish the 2nd Infantry Division Friendship Home near Kapyon to care for children orphaned by the war. When they returned to the line in late July, the men of the Indian Head Division discovered they were sitting right on top of a keg of dynamite by the name of Old Baldy. The Reds wanted the Barren Mountain as badly as we did, and for the next two months, the crest changed hands several times. On August 1st, Indian Head troops were in possession of the crest. Then on September 18th, the Reds recaptured Old Baldy. Heavy air and artillery fire was immediately focused on the enemy. September 20th, 2nd Division infantrymen retake the crest of Old Baldy and successfully beat off enemy counterattacks. Indian head troops dig in to stay. With Old Baldy once again in 2nd Division hands, the Reds shifted their attacks to the nearby ridges known as Arrowhead, Pork Chop, and T-Bone Hill. From October through December, the troops defending these three strongholds were under constant alert as the communists tried again and again to overrun the positions. Each time, the Reds were stopped and turned back short of the top, leaving hundreds of their dead and wounded behind to litter the hillsides. In December of 1952, the men of the 2nd Division played host to two distinguished visitors. The first was President-elect Dwight D. Eisenhower. Then came Francis Cardinal Spellman, who visited the Warriors on Christmas Day. Later, the Cardinal held a Christmas Mass and ate dinner with soldiers representing each of the Indian head units. All prayed that the war would be over by next Christmas. Seven months later, the war in Korea ended with the signing of the armistice at Panmunjom. The United Nations had proven to the world its determination to defend free men against all armed aggression. It was proof which would make the communists think twice before starting another fight. The date? December 25th, 1953. The place? An elementary school 20 miles east of Seoul. You're with the 2nd Infantry Division, playing Santa Claus to a few hundred Korean kids. This party marks your fourth Christmas in Korea. These are the moments when you can forget names like the Pusan Perimeter, Kunu Ri, Wanju, Inje, Bloody Ridge, Heartbreak Ridge, Old Baldy, Arrowhead Ridge, the Pork Chop, T-Bone Hill, and the places in between. You're with the 2nd Infantry Division, and now, after four years in Korea, you're finally going home. Your job has been done, and done well. You know it. And so does the nation that had counted on you. 
You're with the 2nd United States Infantry Division, second to none, and proud to be aboard. And that is the story, the story of the United States 2nd Infantry Division in Korea. Truly the men of the Indian Head Division have lived up to their motto, second to none. Now this is Sergeant Stuart Queen inviting you to be with us next week for another look at the United States Army in action on The Big Picture. The Big Picture is a weekly television report to the nation on the activities of the Army at home and overseas. Produced by the Signal Corps Pictorial Center. Presented by the United States Army in cooperation with this station too can be an important part of the big picture. You can proudly serve with the best equipped, the best trained, the best fighting team in the world today, the United States Army. From Korea to Germany. From Alaska to Puerto Rico. All over the world, the men and women of your army are on the alert to defend our nation, you, the American people, against aggression. This is the big picture. Welcome to The Big Picture, presented by your United States Army. I'm Captain Carl Zimmerman. Today, The Big Picture tells the story of the Army combat team. What happens in one day of war? Fighting in Korea, over mountainous country, often in freezing weather, against an enemy far superior in numbers, demanded a new combat technique. Well, today, The Big Picture shows you how the Army met that demand, fighting as a team, using firepower against manpower. One more day of war, and the news is lost in a two-line communique from the battlefront. But behind this colorless report is the story of the world's greatest fighting team, the American Army Combat Team, a tough and mobile assault force which can hit anywhere, anytime. This day of war has not been won by the infantryman alone, fighting his way across the nameless mountains of Korea, nor by the strategists behind him. For today, America's military answer to war is firepower, teamwork, and mobility, a shattering land, sea, and air combat machine geared and equipped to do any size job in the shortest time and with the fewest casualties possible. Guns of all caliber laying down a hail of fire. Other armies commit vast manpower resources to battle and rely on man's expendability. The American army fights a war of firepower instead of manpower. Providing that firepower, backed by the finest weapons in the world, is the army combat team. A combined assault force which relies on the sheer weight of its steel and explosives for its maximum effectiveness. The 8th Army in Korea, called the greatest army the world has ever known, earned that honor fighting the firepower and combat team technique. Korea, with its snow, mountains, cold, and many military problems, has evolved a new concept for waging war. That concept is to have the best weapons, providing the biggest volume of firepower, and to keep the fighting units flexible and mobile enough to be used quickly and effectively. The combined weapons of the United States Army are superior to those of any other army in the world. The M1 Garand rifle, basic weapon of the infantrymen. 
the Browning automatic rifle ripping off 500 rounds a minute and providing accurate fire against enemy soldiers. Rocket launchers, better known as bazookas, capable of punching a hole through nine inches of steel and blasting fortifications, gun emplacements, and tanks. Machine guns, the backbone of infantry firepower, light and heavy, able to deliver large volumes of continuous fire. Mortars, workhorse of the front line, ready to lob shells up and over the enemy's defenses. And the miracle weapon of them all, the recoilless rifle, an easy firing weapon packing the punch of an artillery piece. These are the weapons which give the army command of the battlefield. Weapons unequaled in the world for firepower, mobility, and accuracy. And backing the infantrymen and those weapons is the rest of the combat team, tanks, artillery, and planes of the Air Force. Patrols are sent out to find the enemy as preparations for combat begin. Observation posts make their reports Enemy bunkers are sighted, and the patrol leader refers their position to the artillery. The early morning quiet is shattered as salvo after salvo saturates the enemy position. From somewhere in the air, the sound of a lone plane is heard, and the waiting infantrymen on the ground know that a last-minute air reconnaissance is being made. These army observers take to the air in small aircraft to spot targets for artillery and obtain information about the enemy. Carrying no armament of any kind, these grasshoppers daily penetrate far behind enemy lines, gathering intelligence reports. The attack hour approaches and the combat team readies itself. is fed into the guns. Tank engines roar into action, drowning out the whine of artillery shells overhead, and together the armored infantry unit moves out. The tanks and the infantrymen fight together as a team, making up for each other's shortcomings. Protecting the men on foot, the tanks probe and patrol ahead, ready to defend the team of soldiers at its side. At the same time, the ground troops protect their tank from enemy fire and assist it by directing its gunfire to strategic areas. A telephone connected to the back of the tank welds the separate members into a fighting team. By fire and movement, our army advances. While tanks and machine gun crews lay down a blanket of fire to keep the enemy pinned down, the attacking force pushes forward, killing and routing the enemy and knocking out emplacements. If enemy resistance cannot be broken by the soldier on foot, the tank is there to move ahead and blast the objective with its heavier firepower. Aiding the infantryman in his dangerous mission are the mortars and the artillery, which bring down a curtain of death just in front of the advancing troops. Directed by their own forward observers, the artillery and mortar units inch their fire slowly forward, wiping out opposition from the path of the tanks and the infantry. 
As the front line men advance, so the gunners adjust their sights and continue to pour out the bombardment. Supply roads are blocked and reinforcements are sealed off. When difficult terrain makes it impossible for our tanks to fulfill their task and the enemy cannot be flushed from his positions, teamwork in combat again answers the emergency. The word is passed back for tactical air support. Awaiting their call to action are the F-51s and jets, which carry the firepower technique into the air and support the ground forces with pinpoint bombing. Integrated with the ground tank infantry artillery team, these planes add to the combined firepower. They are armed with six 50 caliber machine guns and 10 five inch rockets. The planes also carry napalm and demolition bombs. The pilots receive their final instructions and get up-to-the-minute information on the latest tactical situation. Then, the pilots join the combat team. take off for the combat zone to do from the air what cannot be done from the ground. Mustang fighters, veterans of World War II, are still preferred for cover by ground forces because they can remain over the lines longer than the faster jets. With speed and accuracy, they dive on the target, strafing the enemy, bombing and burning him out. By using the latest communication devices, pilots can soften up the enemy within yards of their infantry buddies. One of these devices is the Air Ground Liaison Team. Talking directly to the pilots by radio from a jeep, a ground observer helps the planes pinpoint the target. Hand in hand, the ground and air units join in combined attack using teamwork to keep the assault rolling. More than ever before, the Army is today using the air to link its fighting units. The role of the helicopter in combat has far outgrown the expectations of the strategists who first used it, and more and more these copters are being used for battle missions. Reinforcements rush to weak points in the line. The wounded are speedily carried to medical aid strapped to the sides of the helicopter. To the men on the line, these copters have become messengers of life or death. Rushing ammunition to cut off units, evacuating the wounded, and carrying the fight across impassable terrain, the helicopters strengthen the lifeblood of the fighting man. Assault teams fully armed for battle can hop from mountain to mountain, preparing the way for the troops that follow. In warfare today, Mobility of firepower is the key to victory. Recognizing this important factor, the Army has made the regimental unit its core in combat. To act quickly in battle, the Army has given the regimental unit its own command and the necessary firepower backing to do any job. These regimental combat teams assigned their own tank and artillery forces have become the backbone of America's fighting army. Instead of an unwieldy army organized for action at divisional or corps level, America's fighting force is now split into fast-moving, highly mobile attack teams of regimental strength, which have their own supporting artillery and heavy weapons units. In general, 
General Ridgway's own words, the new tactical trend is this. We are not interested in real estate. We are interested only in inflicting maximum casualties on the enemy with minimum losses to ourselves. To do this, we must wage a war of maneuver, slashing at the enemy when he withdraws and fighting delaying actions when he attacks. Doing this job is the Armored Task Force Team. It's a technical job taking all the resources of science and industry to meet its demands. Observation of the enemy is no longer a soldier looking through field glasses. It's a mathematical process run by soldier scientists. Delicate instruments which see the flash of enemy guns and give their location in terms of a compass reading, making it a matter of seconds before an artillery gun pounds the target into silence or microphones used as listening posts. Cables lead from each microphone. And the press of a button gives the army a battery of ears. From the recording of the sound impulses, calculations are made which give the range and direction of the enemy artillery. And in the world of weather, the radio sonde, an instrument which continuously transmits humidity and pressure readings, is carried aloft by hydrogen-filled balloons. Technicians on the ground listen in to the weather above and forecasts are made. Radar is used to search out enemy mortar shells. When a shell is spotted, it is tracked by radar and its arc of flight revealed. Plotting backwards, a specialist trace the original path of the shell back to the enemy mortar and another target is ready to be destroyed. This is science behind the combat team. Science is also used by the Signal Corps, fighting its war of communication in the thick of combat, stringing telephone lines. snapping battle orders over spluttering hand radios, acting as the Army's nerve system, linking the individual efforts into a master plan. However hard the going, the long tentacles of communication are stretched out. If ground obstacles get too tough for the pole climbers, they lay the wire by plane. If it can't be done the modern way, then they will do it the old way. Sturdy, sure-footed mules often replace the jeep in the rugged country of Korea. Using everything they can, Signal Corps linemen get the job done. Communication with forward areas not yet linked by permanent lines is effectively established by the use of the pigeon service. In unique situations, pigeons are used on infantry and tank patrols into enemy territory when radio silence must be maintained or when foot messengers would be exposed to heavy enemy fire. Forward command posts also use pigeon carriers to send messages back to core headquarters. When released, the bird circles high to get its bearings and then sets its course straight for its home loft at Corps headquarters. It's another part of the teamwork in combat. The information gets through and a new fire mission begins. Making the advance possible, too, is the Army Engineer Corps, the builders and wreckers who drill and blast a path through the mountains. repairing roads and bridges. The army construction workers do their part to keep the fighting machine rolling smoothly. 
searching for mines and removing their sting. Combat engineers must devise field expedients like the construction of this aerial tramway to conquer the mountains of Korea. Using local labor, a half-inch steel cable is hauled to the upper terminus more than 2,000 feet away. At the hilltop, deep holes are drilled into solid rock to provide firm anchorage for the track cable. A winch on a two and one half ton truck is used to put the required tension on the cable spanning the gulf. Again improvising, engineers modify a rear wheel of a three-quarter ton truck to allow the vehicle's engine to serve as motive power for the traction cables, which will raise and lower the sky car. Test runs are carried out, and communication is established between the terminals. Then, supplies are loaded on the tramway for the first trip along its 2,000-foot cable up to the 500-foot summit. By such methods as these, the transportation time for a difficult journey is reduced from hours to a smooth glide of several minutes. The engineers fulfill another vital function. Further strengthening the combat team, the Army has its airborne assault force a rugged fighting unit in itself, equipped with artillery and heavy weapons. Held in the rear for special assignments, it can hurtle from out of the sky a complete regiment fully armed for combat. Before the paratroopers join the battle, there is equipment to be checked and prepared for the drop. Chutes must be examined and folded with precision. Artillery and other heavy weapons must be lashed to their landing boards. Huge C-119 transports wait to take on their cargo. The equipment they carry is heavy and space counts. Special rollers make it easy to load the heavy equipment onto the waiting planes. and the men are given a final briefing before takeoff. flashes from the pilot signaling the drop zone has been reached and one by one the men hit the silk followed by their weapons. In three and a half seconds the full load of heavy weapons is out of the plane and quartermaster airborne soldiers jump out after them. After the drop it takes three minutes to unlash a jeep and drive it away and the 105 millimeter howitzer is ready for action in 20 minutes. More and more men arrive, quickly reforming and taking up the attack. In this way, the Army continues its fight, circumventing fixed enemy defenses and severe natural obstacles. By using parachute drops, fighting units cut off from the main fighting body can be kept fully supplied with food and weapons. The airborne combat team is a strong right arm that can stretch anywhere to deliver its Sunday punch. This is teamwork paying off. The Army of today, fighting a war of mobility, speed, and effectiveness, packing more firepower than any other nation in the world. Exchanging fire for flesh. The United States Army Combat Team. That's your Army in action today, fighting with firepower and teamwork. Now we'd like you to meet Lieutenant Colonel Robert B. Pridgen of Henderson, North Carolina. 
Colonel Fridgen recently returned from Korea, where he served as a battalion commander for 13 months with the 17th Infantry Regiment of the Army's 7th Division. Well, Colonel Fridgen, you can tell how our Army put this firepower and teamwork into action in Korea. Yes, I sure can, Carl. We have the finest combat team in the world. It really makes our soldiers have confidence in the Army to look around them as they move into the attack, see tanks, infantry, everything we have moving right along with them. Let's talk about our weapons. How did ours compare with the enemy's? Well, our weapons are far superior to anything that the enemy has shown with us at, to date. Uh, they are faster, they're more easily operated, more easily transportable, portable, more mobile. In fact, it's, uh, our weapons are far superior to any that the enemy has used. Uh, Army aviation over there in Korea, this helicopter and the small plane, they were part of the combat team too, weren't they? <laughs> well, yes. The, uh, Helicopter it has really a, a step in the right direction, I think. Uh, we used it in Korea, in my unit primarily, for evacuation. A man may be seriously wounded on a hill. If we had to use a normal litters to take him down, it would take a matter of hours. By calling for a helicopter, he's evacuated to safety and to an aid station or hospital in a matter of minutes. Also, they occasionally bring up mail and hot rations to the troops on top of those hills. Well, certainly the helicopter was an important part of our combat team in Korea, wasn't it? Yes, I saw that helicopter. I didn't have any experience with it. It's very good. It'll transport a squad and with equipment to the top of those hills. Whereas if the squad had to walk, it would take six to 10 hours. They can now get that a matter of minutes. Mm -hmm. And it takes a good deal time to get up to the top of the hill over there, doesn't it? Especially when you have to fight your way up, Colonel. It may take days, Carl, at times. Mm -hmm. Well, now, uh, let's talk about the methods of fighting. How did our methods compare with the enemy's? Well, the enemy normally attacked at night. He attacked in waves, utilizing masses of troops. The first wave would be armed only with hand grenades. They'd come running up the hill throwing grenades, screaming, blowing bugles, beating drums, anything to try and put fear in our people in the dark and make them run. They ran right into our machine guns with uh, just get mowed down, keep coming. Mm -hmm. That's quite a contrast. We, we have a good deal more respect for the individual soldier, haven't we? And that's why we use this firepower. That's true. We utilize our firepower a lot of times in place of personnel. Mm -hmm. Well, all in all, Colonel, how would you say this combat team worked out in Korea? To a great advantage, Carl, uh, due to the nature of the terrain in Korea, we could uh, more effectively employ our weapons and personnel by breaking the units down to smaller combat teams and trying to employ them in a great force. Thank you, Colonel. You've given us a good picture of how we put this teamwork and firepower onto the battlefield. That's the way we fight in a combat team, units working together, welding their firepower into a great fighting machine that is your army today. Thank you, Colonel Pridgen, for being with us. Next week on our big picture, we'll tell you about the Army's citizen soldier. We'll talk about the information and education program. We'll point out how this soldier of ours has become the best informed, the best educated soldier in the world today. This is Captain Carl Zimmerman inviting you to be with us then.